We pray. Father in heaven, thank you again for giving us the afternoon. Father, as we continue to look at your word, we invite you to come and teach us, imprint, imprint the things of God on our souls, that we may be able to live them out and to share them with others as we go outside. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll continue. So I have like, if not 15 minutes to finish. I have like 15 minutes to finish what we, we started, and then we'll go into the afternoon presentation. Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay, so we read, the last verse that we read was Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We read verse, verse 20, right? Now that this is a Bible study, so you must keep your Bibles in hand. I'll be asking you to read as well, right? Amen? Amen. Oh, so that no one sleeps, right? Yeah. So we read Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. It says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Then I ran you through Romans chapter 7, where Paul laments his sinful nature because the law condemns even the sinful nature, right? So we stopped somewhere there. So let's pick it up in Psalms. Psalms 140, 143 verse 2. Someone to open to Psalms 143 verse 2. Psalms 143 verse 2. Loudly, please. It says, In thy sight shall no man what? Shall no man what? Living be justified, right? So how are we justified in the sight of God then? Through Christ, right? It is only through that one man called Christ that the whole human race is justified. And our belief in him, we're talking about faith, right? Faith in him is what makes us just before God. So even a just man, his faith alone is wavering, but not the faith that he has in his object. And we say that the object of our faith is who? What is the object of our faith? It is Jesus, right? It was the faith of Jesus. It is the faith of Jesus that is well-pleasing to God. Okay, so let's look at an example in the Bible. We have an example of one man called Abraham, right? Abraham. No, Abraham, right? Before he was Abraham, he was what? Abraham, right? Now let me ask you a question. Why did God add the H to his name? Life, right? Huh? Even Sarah was, she was Sarah, right? Before she became Sarah, right? And God added the H, right? And in the Hebrew, the H is the head, right? It's like a man lifting his hands and his legs like this. I mean, he's, he's saying, hey, I'm alive. Or when you say in, in English, you say what? You say, hi. Hi, how are you? That's the hey, okay? So God added the H. He was adding life to them. And that's how they were able to give life. Give birth to who? Isaac, right? So God needs to add something to our dead bodies. And that is his life. So that we're able to give fruits. Are we together? So for example, Abraham, the father of faith. Even him, he listened to his wife, went and slept with his maid, Hagar. And what happened? Poof, came out who? Ishmael, right? So they were trying to assist God in his plan. Trying to use man-made plans to achieve God's main objective. Are we together? So they were trying to do things on their own, but God had promised that you will have a son, and that son will come from your what? Your loins, and not this son that you've had. 
So we have that picture that even Abraham, the father of faith, his faith weathered at some point. It became unstable at some point. But he went on to have faith in somebody else and believed God's promises. If you read it from, I think it's, it's Romans chapter 4, it explains the faith that Abraham displayed in God. It says he believed in him that, okay, let's go to, let's go to Romans, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, I'll use my phone. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. This one tells us that what then are we to say about Abraham, our human ancestor? Then verse 2 says, For if Abraham was justified by actions... He would not have something to he would have something to boast about, though not before God. Did you hear that? So if Abraham was justified by his actions, he would have something to boast before God, right? But not before God, because no one can boast via his works before God. Are we together? I want us to be together. Are we together? Okay. So he continues, he says. For what does the scripture say? Verse 3, it says, For what does the scripture say? It says that Abraham did what? Abraham believed God and it was what? It was counted, it was credited unto him as what? Righteousness. So he believed what God said and it was counted unto him for righteousness. If you go down, it says... Verse 13, it says in the same chapter, for the promises that he, for the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness produced by what? Produced by what? Faith, right? Okay. Let's go on. I'll, I'll read, I'll read verse 16. It says, therefore, this is the conclusion. The promise is based on faith so that it might be a matter of grace and might be granted to all of Abraham's descendants, not only for those who were given the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 18, it says, Hoping in spite of hopelessness circumstances, he believed that it would be so. The father of many nations just has the father of many nations just as he had been told, this is how many descendants will come. Then 19 it says, his faith did not weaken when he when he thought about his own body, which was already dead, has which was already as good as dead, now that he was about 100 years old, or of Sarah's inability to give children. Nor did he doubt God's promises out of lack of faith. Instead, his faith became stronger, and he glorified, and he gave glory to God. He was absolutely convicted that God would do that which he had promised. So Abraham was 100 years old. And Sarah was about 90-something, right? But this couple believed God. And because they believed God, they acted on the promises of who? God. God had promised. And when God has promised, God is not a man that he can lie. Men do lie, but not God, right? Men do lie, but not God. So let's go back to our lesson on faith. The process of developing, why did, why did Abraham's faith at some point just became weak? And then he went ahead and listened to his wife. What do you think? Why did he? All of a sudden, this is a man that God calls my friend. 
But even the friend of God, at some point, his faith became a little bit weak. Why? Yes, sir. Uh, I think it's because uh, God delayed for what uh, he told So there was more like a delay, right? But does God delay? In actuality, does God delay? Huh? So his time is always right, right? So we might, in our own human conception, we think God has delayed. Actually, even as we go into glad tidings, as we talk about the afternoon, the afternoon lesson, is that you will see that it seems that Jesus Christ has delayed, right? But you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked as we go. Why so the so-called delay is there? So sometimes God will pro- prolong in bringing to fruition things that we've asked him or things that he has promised that they should come. But the question is that, was it on God's side? Was the fault on God's side or was the fault on human side? Do we find fault with God? Huh? Do we find fault with God? No. So we should always, when I fail to understand something, I shouldn't go directly and, and, and raise my fist at the mighty God, but I should look within, right? I should look within, maybe the fault is with me. The reason why the fulfillment does not come. So Abraham, God's way of developing, the process of developing faith, faith in God seemed long and hard for Abraham. It seemed what? Long and hard. Man is an impatient creature. And God knows that very well. Now you and me are very impatient. We want things to be done our way right now, right? That is why we have instant things like Instagram, Insta this and all this. We just have these instant things, right? There's what is called in psychology, it's called instant gratification. We want things now, here, everything now. You want when you finish your education, for example, some of you will be finished, you want to get a job just right there and then. But God has a process through which you need to go through because God sees beyond what we see, right? So we usually want to come up with a shortcut of getting that which we've asked God to get. We pray to God. We fasted. We've done this. But God says, not now. And it is the no of God. When God says no, by the way, in the Bible, the high priest had two stones, right? There was the Fuma and then there was the Urim, right? When Israel wanted to go for war, the high priest would go in and then consult with God, and then one of the stones would shine. Okay? So there was the Urim. When the Urim shined, it was a white stone. When it shined, then God had said, yes, go ahead. Do this. But when the Fuma, which was black, shined, that says God has said no. But do you know what the Fuma meant? It meant it's the no of God. But when God says no, it's because he is perfecting you. Huh? When God says no, he is perfecting you. When he says yes, you're not going to learn so much from there. But through the no of God, there is perfection. Are we together? So for the most of the things that God has said no, he is perfecting you. But you are frustrated with God. But God has got a higher object in dealing with us as human beings. Because he knows his object is to save you. He gives you that job right now, you become a thief. He gives you that job right now, you start doing your own stuff. So even, listen, as we, it's not about what you're asking God. It's about what you're becoming while you're asking God. What are you becoming while you're waiting for that thing to come? Are you becoming impatient? Are you becoming... What is happening to you at the character level, at the heart level, as you've asked God for that thing? That is what God is interested in. 
even as we wait for Jesus. It's not about the event of him coming, but it's about what are we becoming while we're waiting for him. Because that is what will matter. Are you with me? That is what matters. So God looks at us right now, he says they are not ready. They are not ready. You and me, the church itself is not ready. So it's in mercy that we even have a delay, by the way. Because if he comes now, who is going to heaven? How many are going to heaven? Only God knows, right? But are you supposed to be Satan about your salvation? Yes. Let's go ahead. So, it is through the purification of God saying no, that he wants a faith which is genuine, right? And genuine faith is equated in the Bible as gold, right? There's the golden faith that God wants from us. And how, does, how is God purified? In fire, guys. Are you with me? God is purified in fire. It has to go through the fire, the crucible, the work, the heating, the crushing into small pieces and all this, passing through that. And when the, when the smith, the one who is purifying the gold, is done, do you know what he does when he's done with the gold? To check if it's pure, he would lift up the, the court plate, the, the golden plate, and then look at it. If he sees his reflection, then he knows it's pure. So God wants to purify his people. And when he sees himself reflecting, he knows it's ready, it's gold. He knows we're ready. But we don't, we are avoidant. We are a generation that avoid, that is pain avoidant. We want to avoid the whole process. And just poof, you're in heaven. Yeah, it's just okay, everything is fine. No, God says, we have to go through the fire. It's in much tribulation that we'll get into heaven. So he's asking, listen, sometimes I'm going to bring affliction to you for the purpose of purifying you. Look at what happened to Job. What happened to Job? He went through the fire, are you with me? And he came out, he was blessed a double portion. Right? He was blessed far much more. But usually as human beings, we don't want that. We don't want to go through the fire. We complain, we mama, we are like the children of Israel. We mama when God makes us pass through the wilderness. We are murmuring, we are saying this and all this, and it's that murmuring that led to the fall. This is for by the internal chatter, the murmuring in our heads that we have against God. So God wants us to come through the golden faith that comes through by suffering. And then there's the silver faith. The silver faith is that silver itself is obedience in the Bible. So we obey the gospel by preaching the gospel. Are you with me? We preach it out. We lead it out. That's like obeying the gospel. So there's two, five of, two, two types of faith that God demands from us. There's the golden one. And that's what he wants from each one of us. The golden one, the one that has passed through suffering and trials. By the way, who was the greatest man in the Bible? Huh? John the Baptist. Why? How many miracles did he perform? None. None. How many people did he raise from the dead? None. None. Never performed any miracles. Why did Jesus call him the greatest among his all that were born of a woman? But that's not the reason why. No, that's not the reason why. He suffered. Read it from great from desire of ages. Read it from desire of ages, the chapter on John the Baptist. It says when there's a chapter called He Must Increase. Okay? Read it there. It says the the greatest wealth of trust that God could give to a man is suffering with him. And John the Baptist was called the greatest among us all that were ever born and could ever be born of a woman because he suffered. So you mean suffering is wealth? It's wealth. <laughs> With God it is wealth. God says these are my workmanship, suffering. Suffering is the workmanship that he has ordained. He has ordained, put a stamp to suffering. 
So that when we go through that, you come out at the end of it, you've got pure golden faith. That's why John the Baptist is the greatest among us all. Are you with me? He's the greatest. He never performed any miracle. And notice, all he did was preach. But some of us want, you want to be seen as great when you perform miracles. When you do this, when everybody goes like, the Bible says that which is highly esteemed among us men is an abomination before the face of God. That which we highly esteem us before God, it's an abomination. It's, it's like this with God. Are you with me? So we have John the Baptist who comes. By the way, we are supposed to be the John the Baptist movement, right? The ones that preach and prepare the way for the coming of the king. So guess what we have to go through? Guess what we have to go through? Suffering. Suffering. Right now there's no persecution. It's cool to be SDA, right? You're cool, everybody else allows you to pray like this. Long time ago, you couldn't see like you. They come and they behead this guy. They behead this guy. They behead this one. They behead this one. There's blood all over. But Ellen White says about the persecutions that every blood that dropped to the ground more sprang from there. More people joined. And the devil said, no, you know what? This is not working. Persecuting them is not working. So what should I do? Oh, let me entice them. That's how, that's how the Reformation was somehow corrupted. Because he started enticing the people, giving them position, giving them money. The devil will give you wealth just to keep you from getting to heaven. He will give you everything just to pamper you and sleep. He wants us to be asleep while the work is happening in the most holy place. So the pastors, they'll be pampered with money and all this. They won't talk to you about the things that I'm talking to you about right now. It will be all sweet words. Church building. If you build a church, yeah. But we're not building the people that are in the church. We're building a church. Very beautiful churches that have been built. But are we building the people in the church? Are we preparing them for the second coming of Jesus? That's the main question. Yeah? So, so we have the silver. And when there's bronze in the Bible, bronze is fake faith. If you have got bronze, I mean, there's wood, hay, and stubble. Wood, hay, and stubble kind of faith is, it's the wooden kind of faith. What happens to wood when it passes through the fire? It just bends into ashes. And one warning that we're given in the spirit of prophecy is this, that do not allow the fires of persecution, of suffering that you're going to go through, to bail you as wood, and hay, and stubble. And you know how we get bent? When we're passing through persecution, when we're complaining, and all this, you're just wood. You're going to bed. And you become resentful, hateful, vengeful. You become this bitter person in the process of passing through all this. But God has meant that you should be purified of all those. All those. Let go of all the hate, the pain, the jealousy, and all this, so that when you come out, you are pure God. So don't allow whatever you're going through. It might be a personal thing. Okay, first of all, it starts personal. And then another person is going through, another person is going through. And then you find that the whole church is going through some suffering. God is preparing you for the time of trouble. Because when that time comes, when that time comes, the devil has full control over human beings. Are you with me? Right now I'm doing a series with DK. It's on demon possession. We'll be doing, we'll be doing part three this Sunday, tomorrow, that is. But three. And one thing that you're going to discover is this about demons. There will be a time when they will have full control over human beings. Full control. The Holy Spirit will be withdrawn from this world, and it will be only with those that are true followers of Christ. God will have the perfect reflection in his people, and the devil will have the perfect reflection in his people. So you have two groups. Are you with me? Are you with me? So that time is near. I'm telling you, you should listen to part two. I think I have it on YouTube. You should listen to part two of how we looked at the time of Jesus. What's, what, when it says in the fullness of time Jesus Christ came, what made the time fullness? What was happening before Jesus Christ came? 
during that time. It's there in these hour pages. When you discover what was happening and then you compare what is happening now, you see that the environment is the same. It's the same. There was one language spoken, and then there was one language spoken. The, uh, under the time of Jesus, when Jesus Christ was about to come, there was one government ruling. We're about to go into one government ruling. Are you with me? Are you with me? It's fine that these events were there. Demonic activity was so much during the time when Jesus Christ came. And right now, I see a lot of young people. A lot of young people are suffering under torments of demons. Not only mental illness. There's a lot of mental illness right now going on, but it's attached to demon possession. So I'm telling you that the environment is right. Are you with me? Okay, let's go on. So Revelation chapter 3, we are counseled by God to do something. Revelation chapter 3, it's a message to the Laodicean church. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, it says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire. There you go. You see that? It says, I counsel you to buy of who? Where do we buy the gold? It says, buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that you may be rich and white remnant, that you may be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes up that you may see. That you may see. You know, right now we are looking, but we're not seeing. It's possible to look, but you're not seeing. Very possible. You're, you're looking, but you're not seeing. God says you need eyes up, so that the scales from your eyes fall off and you begin to see what's really happening. And the only thing that is going to open our eyes is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. To see what's really happening, what's really going on around me. Even to see the horrors of your own soul. Are you with really? me? For you to see who you really are and know yourself and not be filled with pride. Others are dozing. And not be filled with pride. The only thing that is going to make us open our eyes is the Holy Spirit. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 3, it says, let's go to the book of Malachi chapter 3, verse 3. I'm trying to rush so that we go into, yeah, I think we have enough time. We'll be able to finish. Malachi chapter 3, verse 3. Somebody to read. Somebody to read. Malachi 3, 3. Malachi chapter 3. Okay, you want me to read? Since people are still flipping their Bibles. Okay, you can read. Of silver, right? Uh huh. As gold and what? Silver, right? Continue. That I may offer to the Lord and mm-hmm. offer in righteousness. So God is going to page us, right? He who pages has gold and silver. Remember, we talked about the faith of God and silver. That's what he's interested in. So he will purge us, he will sit as a refiner's purifier of silver, and that they may offer offering unto the Lord, an offering in what? In righteousness. The righteousness which is acceptable before God. Not our own offerings, right? You're still looking for Malachi. Wow, this is interesting. It's the last book of the Old Testament. <laughs> Just before Matthew. <laughs> okay, so God, God and silver is what God desires from us. So he says, buy of me. So Christ is the one who gives us this gold and silver. Are we together, church? Are we together, brothers and sisters? Amen. Okay, so Isaiah 40. Let's read Isaiah. Isaiah 45. Verse 17. Isaiah 45, verse 17. And then I want someone to open Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Someone to open Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we'll read Isaiah 45, verse 17. I'll read verse 17. It says, It says, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting what? With an everlasting salvation, ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded, world without ends. 
So he says, Israel, the Israel of God, shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting what? Salvation. So there is the everlasting salvation, everlasting covenant, everlasting gospel. This is one and the same thing. Are we together? So we shall be saved with something which is everlasting. Everlasting means without beginning and without what? Ending. That is how big our salvation is. Somebody say amen. That is how big our salvation is. So somebody to open Hebrews chapter 2. So the everlasting gospel is through an everlasting being who is Christ himself. We exercise faith in the one who stood mightily for us in the great controversy. He, has, he was not ashamed of us. He was not ashamed of us. He minimized the shame of being identified with lesser beings, with weak and sinful beings as us. Was Jesus ashamed of us? Was Jesus ashamed of identifying himself with you, my sister, with you, my brother? Was he ashamed? No, he wasn't. But is it God eternal? Yes. But he identified himself with what? Lower beings. Let me give you this example. Imagine there's man, there's a dog, and then there's a worm. And then man, okay, as I'm giving you an illustration. There is man, dog, and the worm. You know what a worm is, right? Yes. So man changes from being man, he changes and then he becomes a worm. In order to help the worm. Do you know how disgusting a worm is? Everybody, when they see a worm, what do they do? Either they cringe, they tear away, they can't just step on it, right? It's not something which is... So like, in the, in the order of creation, there is God, there are angels, and then there is man. So God comes down from an infinite level, he comes down, he lowers himself to a position of a worm. Didn't, didn't God say, I am a worm and no man? Jesus said that. Are you with me? Okay, you don't believe me. Let's go to Psalms before we read Hebrews. Hold on to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Let's go to Psalms, Psalms 22. Open Psalms 22. Somebody to start reading from verse 1. You see what is being talked about here. Psalms 22. We're reading Psalms 22. Open to Psalms 22. Verse 1. Verse 1. Start reading from verse 1 loudly, please, so that everybody else is able to get you. Who is speaking? How do you know this is Jesus Christ? It's on the cross. That's what he called out on the cross. Are we together? Listen to what he says. He says, my God, my God, why have you done what? Forsaken me, continue. Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my Mm -hmm. Continue. Mm -hmm. But thou art holy, O thou, O thou that inhabited the praises of Israel. Mm -hmm. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. Mm -hmm. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. Were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. They were not confounded. But I am a worm. I am a what? A I am a what? A I am a worm. Continue. But I am aware I'm no man. No man. A reproach of men. A reproach of men. And despised of the people. Despised of the people. This is Jesus. He says, I am a worm and no man. A reproach of men. Despised, right? You know, when you look at a worm, you despise like, hey, who wants worms around them? He says, this is me. Other people, the fathers cried out, you heard them. But Father, why have you forsaken me? This is what Jesus Christ, this is what was going on in his mind on the cross. Are we together? This is what Psalms chapter 22 is revealing. And there's something interesting about that worm, by the way. It's a specific worm. If you read it in the Hebrew, because me, I like to go back and check. What this worm? What does it mean? So I'm giving you homework. I'll tell you what it means, but you have to do your own homework. Okay? That worm is, is a type of worm that gets pregnant. Are you with me? It gets pregnant, 
climbs on a tree, climbs on a tree, hanging on a tree, and then it drops on the ground, then the children come out from the stomach. Are you with me? It climbs on a tree and then drops on the ground. I mean, it, uh, the stomach opens when the children are born. When the children have to start eating the worm for them to survive, and then the worm dies. You think I'm joking? Google. If you think I'm joking, that's a type of worm being mentioned there. And that is Jesus who came and died. And he says, Feed me, right? Feed on me, right? He says, I am the bread. Huh? When we feed on him, we live as his children. He dies so that we live. Are you seeing the connection? That is what Jesus, he climbs on the tree. These things are not coincidence. There's, there's no coincidence in the Bible. I don't believe in coincidence. Okay? So this is what you'll find. This is Jesus. He says, listen, I've lowered myself to their level to uplift them. Are we together? Let's read Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. We we'll read 9, 10, 11, 12. 9, 10 up to 11, sorry. Open the Bibles. Let's read, guys. Are we afraid of reading the word of God, of all things? Yes. But you see Jesus, who was very little, lower than angel from... Sorry. Mm-hmm. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angel for the suffering of death. For the suffering of death. Crowned mm-hmm. with glory and honor. Uh-huh. That he by the grace of God should test death to every man. So wait, just wait. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. All right? So that he should die, right? Yeah, because if you are high up there, you are immortal, you can't die, right? I agree. So he lowers himself so that he should die your death and my death, so that you should never test death. The question is, what kind of death are you not supposed to test that he tested? Huh? What kind of death? Listen, guys, if we don't understand this, we won't know anything about our Christianity. What kind of death? Did Jesus Christ test for every man that every man is not supposed to test? Everlasting death. Are you with me? Eternal death. Second type, second resurrection type of death. Are you with me? So Jesus tested everlasting death. He died everlastingly. Are you with me? So that you and me should not die an everlasting death. You believe in him, you have everlasting what? Life. Are we together? Because he is eternal, he is everlasting. He says you and me should never test eternal death. That is the provision. That's your way out of the seven last plagues. Your way out of the seven last plagues is Jesus. He tested death. So should man find themselves dying that, that everlasting death is because they have rejected who? It's because they have rejected who? The everlasting kind of death I'm talking about is the death that kills the body and the soul. Are you with me? Not just the one that you die today and Jesus says you are asleep. There's that death when you die, he says you're just sleeping, right? But the one that takes you out of existence, Jesus tested it for every man. So no one has no one has a reason to give God and say, listen, you never did anything for me. No, we can't give God that excuse. If I find myself dying the second day, God forbid, if I find myself doing that, it's because I've chosen. Are you with me? The everlasting fire, hell fire, is created for who? Lucifer and his angels. No human being should find himself there. So when human beings find themselves there, what does that tell you? They have chosen their king. Are you with me? No human being, you are supposed to be sure of your salvation. No human being, and your surety is in that one person called Jesus. That is why for me, I'm obsessed with Jesus. I'm so upset. If that's the only thing I'm going to talk about the whole day, let me do that. 
Why? He is our only hope of salvation. He's our only hope of salvation. He's tested death for every man. Read verse 10, my brother. Verse 10. Mm -hmm. For it became him. Mm -hmm. For whom are all things. For whom are how many things? All. all things and? And by whom are all things. By whom are all things? Are you with me? Whom are all things and by whom are all things? So all things are in him. Are you with me? Continue. In bringing many sons unto glory, uh -huh. to make the captive of their salvation perfect through suffering. Perfect through what? Perfect through what? Suffering. So I do avoid suffering. Perfection comes through suffering. Ah, guys, I wish, I wish we could just spend much more time just talking about that, because you you start. The Bible says, rejoice when you suffer. But we don't rejoice, we complain. We murmur when things are not going well, and all this. we cry out, but the Bible says rejoice. <laughs> Why? When you're being tempted, it says rejoice. But we, when we're being tempted, we shriek, right? Like, oh, you start fearing. But God says rejoice. Okay, let's go on. Hebrews 11, read verse 11. And they, that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. Are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Is Jesus Christ ashamed of us? Why are we ashamed of him? Yes, we are. Our lives can tell that. We're ashamed of Jesus. We're ashamed of He's not ashamed. He came born in the manger. Identified himself with you and me. He's not ashamed. Lived the most pulverized kind of life. He's not ashamed. But we as human beings were ashamed of him. Listen, the only stumbling block of why the church was still down here is because we're ashamed of Jesus. We are not ashamed of anything else, but we're ashamed of Jesus. He came to his own. The Bible says Jesus Christ came to his own and his own did what? Received them not. The Jews, he was a stumbling block to them. To the, to the Gentiles and the Greeks, he was like foolishness. So like, he came to his own, his own received him not. And we're still struggling with Jesus. Are you with me? We're, right now, the war is on him. If we get him right, we understand him right, we have him right, then we can go home. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. I'm finishing up this when we go into... Our study. I'll be able to finish, hopefully. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, what does it say? It says, uh -huh. looking unto Jesus, mm -hmm. the author, mm -hmm. the of our faith. Who is the author and finisher of our faith? Jesus. So when you start in faith, do you end in works? Hmm? You start by believing and having faith in Jesus, right? How is the whole process up to the end? It's from faith to faith. Are you with me? It's not faith, but now, okay, now, I believe in God. Now, okay, let me now do it on my own. No. Are you with me? He is the author and finisher of our faith. He starts it and then he finishes it. Huh? There is no point where he needs to be missing in the picture. Are you with me? Okay, continue reading. Who? Who was that was saved before him, mm -hmm. endured the cross, despairing the shame, despising the shame, and sat down at the and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What is the joy of Jesus Christ that was set before him? Huh? No, it's not the cross. The cross he endured. It. He, he, the Bible doesn't say he enjoyed the cross. It says he did what? endured the cross. Was it an easy thing? No, it wasn't. But he endured it. For the joy that was set before him, the joy that was set before him is seeing this brother in heaven, and this one in heaven, this one in heaven, this one in heaven, this one in heaven, everybody else in heaven. That was the joy set before him. And for that, he endured the cross. It wasn't a pleasant thing to go through the cross. To be a naked God. 
on the cross. The Romans never crucified anyone with clothes, by the way. Read your history. So he's there naked, and he's God, eternal God. Naked, and do you want to identify yourself with a man who is naked as a God? Or you would rather identify yourself with Thor, the Avengers, all these powerful, powerful beings, right? Identify yourself as these are gods, our heroes, right? But in Christianity, those are not your heroes. Your hero is the one who is naked on the cross there. Now identify yourself as this is your God. No wonder the Jews were ashamed of him. When they put the placard on top, it was written what? King of the Jews. What did they do, the Jews? They went to Pilate. Hey, listen, change that thing on top there. Like he's, he's not. He says, and what did Pilate say? What I have written, I have written. By the way, inspiration says that was moved by God. This is your king. But they said, no, we have no king but who? Caesar. They denied Jesus. They said, we have no king but Caesar. And that's what the world is doing right now. They're about to put another king as their king. So the question I have, as I see the world moving towards electing a king, coming up with a false religion and all this, the question should go deep into me and ask me, Mike, what is it? Who is your king in your life? Who is ruling on the throne of your heart? Who is there? Are you electing Jesus or you're putting self? Because self and the devil, they like the same things. Are you with me? Self and the devil like the same thing. So who is there on the throne? Is it self or is it Christ? That's a big question we need to ask ourselves on a daily basis. Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40, 50, sorry. This is what, what it says. Isaiah 50 verse 6, somebody to open the Bible. Isaiah 50 verse 6, verse 6 and 7. So read 6 first. Who is reading? Okay, I'll read it. 6 says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheek to them that plucked off the hair. I hide not my face from shame and spitting. This is Jesus. Are you with me? Isaiah is narrating the story of Jesus. This is Yahweh. He was unyielding in his goal to die for you and me. He was unyielding. He didn't yield. He didn't surrender. There was no retreat for him. He was focused. The goal is that you die so that they are saved. The seven, he says, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, will I not be confounded. Therefore, I have set my face as a flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. I will not be ashamed. Now I'll ask you a question as we end this lesson to get into another one. What kept Jesus on the cross? What kept Jesus on the cross? What kept him on the cross? Why didn't he just come out and just, just let go of the whole thing, right? What kept him moving on the cross? The love? The love of the love for man? You could say that. What really kept him moving? Yes. He didn't want man to die? He didn't want man to die, yes. Any other thoughts? Yes. Okay. So here's the thing about Jesus that you need to know. And what really kept him on the cross. It was severe love. What kind of love? Severe love. Love that set him focus. Are you with me? So Jesus Christ has got two qualities. Okay? He is, he is God. He is also Lord. Lord means Yahweh. Are you with me? It means Yahweh. Yahweh means I am that I am. Are you with me? 
I am the one that gives life and takes life. That's Yahweh. I am the self existence one. That's a severe quality of God. God can give life and He can take life. Are you with me? And then there is the Elohim. Elohim quality is His nurturing quality. Nurturing like a mother, right? Are you with me? When you read, this is your homework again. When you read Genesis account, when you read Genesis account, I think it's in chapter 2, you'll find that it says, and the Lord God, and the Lord God, right? And the Lord God. So when you see Lord, that's Elohim. God, no. When you see Lord, that's Yahweh. When you see God, that's Elohim. And the Lord God, and the Lord God, and the Lord God. But when the devil came in to tempt Adam and Eve, to tempt Eve specifically, what did the devil say? Let's read it. Let's go to... No, no, let's go, let's go to the verse. I think it's in chapter 3, right? Open, open your Bibles. Let's see that so that we connect this with this thought. What did the devil say? Um, it's in Genesis chapter 3. Open the Bibles, guys. Let's see the verse. Let me go there as well. Are you there? Okay, so Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. What does it say? Now the serpent was more cunning uh -huh. than in other beasts of the field, which the Lord God... Wait, pause there. We, who made the serpent? What the, you get what I'm saying? It says, Lord who? You see that, that phrase going on, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, right? Which the Lord God made? Continue. What did the serpent say? And he said to the woman, uh -huh. as God who did... Uh-uh, pause there. What did he say? As God who did. Say did he say, and did the Lord God say? No, no he said, God. God. Are you with me? You see how he changes the language. And remember, this is a subtle being. Subtle meaning that he's clever, he's cunning, he can move around, he's a genius. Are you with me? He can easily just, just take one thing and then he changes, right? Listen to what the serpent said. Continue reading. As God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Mm -hmm. Two. Two. And the woman said to the serpent, mm -hmm. We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. Mm -hmm. Three. Three. But of the fruits of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, mm -hmm. You shall not eat it, mm -hmm. nor shall you touch it. Read five. Yes, you touch. Read five. five. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be. Like God, so, knowing good and evil. Is the devil using Lord there? Or is he using the word God? Huh? Why? Why is he, is he using the word God? Why is he not using Lord God? Why? Good, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Huh? Why is he not using Lord God? He's appealing to a certain quality about God. He's appealing because when you say God, it's Elohim. That's like his nature in quality. I'm sure God is denying you this. God is so good. Can he deny you this fruit? Or when you bring in Lord, there's a severe quality of God. Are you with me? Are you with me? There's a severe quality of God where you go like, oh, Lord God. There are two qualities. There's like the hard part of him is severe. He is severe. Are you with me? But it's still love in its severity. But the devil appears to you know, God, you know, God can God do this? Can God really, as he said, it is God who is so so nurturing. You think he can behold withhold something from you? Are you seeing how the devil plays with his language? That's how he plays with his language. And this is 
The quality of Jesus that kept him moving, it's not the nurturing part, but it's the severe quality of him. The unyielding quality, the one that is obedient to the fullest, is what kept him on the cross. It was severe love for humanity. He says, I love them to a point where I would deny myself. Because the other quality, like, God just allows you, right? But the Lord quality is the one that is severe. He says, I'm going to deny myself even to live eternally for the sake of them. That is love. That's what kept him on the cross. That's what kept him focused. It says, he has set his face like a flint. What is a flint? A flint is a tough stone. Are you with me? It's a stone which is hard. So he had set his mind, I am going regardless of what's going to happen. And L.O.I. puts it this way. At the risk of an eternal loss, God went to the cross. You don't understand that. At the risk of an eternal loss, Jesus went through to the cross. It was a risk for Jesus to come here. Do you understand me? Being born in a manger... A frail baby. What would have happened? He dropped to the ground and he dies. He dies still. (laughs) You don't understand. He became a human being 100%. The same way you can die, you also can die. Anything could have happened to Jesus. It was at the risk of an eternal loss that he came here to save you and me. Now, knowing this is the type of God that would risk it all, he says, I cannot exist if they are not with me. So I'm going to go through it all. Tested eternal death. Death could not hold him. Death said, No, we can't hold this one. Are you with me? He's holy, he's pure. He's the only man that was holy and pure. And death said, No, we can't, we can't hold him. We can't hold him for too long. And three days is up. And he resurrects. And he gives us the promise, says, if you believe in me, there is eternal life in you. Somebody say amen to God. This is what we are contending with, guys. So, it's 16 already, I need to go into the other lesson. In order for man to be justified by faith, faith must reach a point where it will control the affections and the impulses of the heart. That's what Ellen White says. And it is by obedience that faith itself is made perfect. In uh, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 336. Unless we believe first, we shall be eternally lost. Are you with me? Unless we believe in this man that I've described to you, who is Jesus Christ himself, we shall be eternally lost. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. To perish is to cease to exist, are you with me? Should not perish, but should have everlasting life. So God is everlastingly awake to save us. All heaven is open for us. All heaven has been thrown open for us. As a matter of fact, I remember reading something from early writings where it said, Listen, the angels of God, they maneuver around the throne of God waiting to see who is going to pray so that we go down. But few people pray. We don't really supplicate the throne of God. Few people are really bending their knees asking for help. God says, command me. God says, command me and I will do something for you. He needs you to trust him wholly and fully. Heaven is thrown open to you. Angels are there to help you. I was just talking to her when we came here and he said, you know, we say we meet at 14 that people are not here. <laughs> Guess what? The angels were here even before you and me. Yeah, they were here. They were here before you and me. And they must be very patient beings. They're very patient with your slackness and my slackness. They're very patient. Now. You know, they would do it with love. But I think, Ellen White says, she said one thing, she said one thing, she said, we tire the angels. They get tired because we're so slow. 
We have our Bibles, God has given us everything, but the angels cry. Like, especially with us as SDs, listen, if an SD finds himself in hellfire, it will be more bitter for him or her. <clears throat> you know what? You've been given everything. You have no excuse. As SDs, we have no excuse. We've been given the plan of salvation. Everything else has been given. I don't know why we are so lazy. We don't want to spend time with God. We want to spend time with other things. We have no excuse for being in hell. As is no excuse whatsoever. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, is the watchword. Is the watchword for the Christian. Now I want to segue into glad tidings. We talk about glad tidings, the latter end, and the glory of God. And I'm going to be very fast because time has gone. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 18. Let's pray first of all before we read. Father in heaven, thank you again, Lord, for being with us as we are finishing our lesson. As we go into the second part of our lesson, Lord, we ask more of the Holy Spirit. Keep us awake mentally, Lord. Uh, may, may not our minds be clogged up with anything. Help us to focus what you're about to say to us and to me as well, Lord. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 18, we'll read verse 1 to 5. We're talking about glad tidings, Lateran and the glory of God. This is just part one. I don't know if we'll be able to finish, but as far as we can go, we'll go. Amen. All right. Who is reading? And after these things, I saw another angel. Come okay, there are two people reading. Who is reading? Oh, okay. Okay, we'll allow the lady to read. Be loud, please. And the head of it, and the cage of every unclean and head for bed. For all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of our fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundancy of our delicacies of our delicacies. And I heard and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my what? My people, that ye be not partakers of our sins, that that ye receive not her plagues. For her sins have done what? Reached unto heaven, and God hath done what? Remembered her iniquity. Do you want to participate in all this? No, God says no. Come out. Are you with me? So there's this mighty angel that comes down, and this angel has great power. And his glory lightens up all the earth. Isn't that interesting? That this angel has got so much power that his glory lightens up all the earth. And then he says, he cries out, he cried mightily with a strong voice. How mighty is that? So we're talking about a loud cry. Are you with me? So this angel cries out mightily with a strong voice. And he's calling upon people because this is the last warning ever to be given to humanity. This is the last warning. The last cries of mercy. And the weighty trust of taking this message has been given to a certain people. Okay? Why is this scripture of importance? Why is it important? Why is this scripture important to us as SDS? I'll outline the reasons why, three of them, and then I'll show you the interested people. People interested parties, not people so much, but interested parties in this message. Are you with me? The first reason why it is important, because it points to the power of God that will attend the proclamation of the three angels' messages. Are you with me? 
So it points to the power. There's a certain power that is going to come, that is going to attend the messages found in Revelation 14, the 6 to 12. That's the three angels' message. So it points to that power which is going to come. Secondly, because we should be ready to receive the endowment which is given, which is spoken of as the latter end, the endowment of power. There is power that is going to be given to this brother and this brother, that sister, that sister, that brother. There is power that is going to be given and we need to be ready for it. And that power is called the latter rain. It's called what? Okay, so thirdly, because it pinpoints to a time of the commencement, so it shows us that there's a time when the commencement of that rain coming now. Are you with me? So those, that's the reason why this scripture is important. So the question is, who are the interested party? Who do you think is interested in this message? There are actually three parties that are interested in this message. Who are, who are interested in this message? First of all, there is God. Then, his people. Then, the devil. Are you with me? He's also interested in this message. So we have three parties. We have God, we have his people, you and me, and then we have the devil. Now why is, why are all these parties interested? First of all, why is God interested? So God is interested in sending the message, the, the angel of Revelation chapter 18 because it will mean that his work of salvation will be carried to its glorious completion and that through his church he will be able to give to the universe a full and final display of his love and grace. So God is so interested because he wants to bring this great controversy to an end. Do you think God enjoys what is going on down here? He enjoys the suffering. No. He's interested because he knows this is the final one. After this, I come. So he's very interested. All heaven is interested in this message. Because it is through his church that he will show the grace and the love of God. There will be a display to the whole universe. And the universe is not only composed with the earth. Are you with me? It's composed with other worlds that you and me cannot see. Actually, the earth is a tiny dot in the universe of God. There are other worlds that have never fallen. And we as the earth are actually a lesson book. Today when you walk up in the morning, Brother Peter, there are unfallen beings that are watching and they're trying to see how the grace of God will be manifolded and will be manifested in your life. We are a lesson book. Are you with me? They're studying and seeing how does in the life of this, how? How is God's grace manifested? What's their response? Why is God so good to these creatures? And all this, they're studying. They're seeing to see we are a lesson book. And there's a time which is coming when God has to put in full display. There's so much that we can say, but we won because of time. So you can read Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8 to 11 at your own time. So God's people, why are they interested? They're interested in the latter end because it will mean that they can reap the final harvest and be taken out of this old sinful world into the city of God. For that you can read Amos chapter 9 verse 11 to 15. That's why we're interested. We reap the final harvest and be taken out of this sinful world. Do you want to continue living here? Who, who really thinks this is home? With all the suffering, the disease, and all this which is happening right now. You know, we can be talking like this, and then one brother just wears a vest full of what? Bombs, and then all of a sudden, right? Then we are all dead. This is how deadly this world has become. He's just moving, and all this. There was, there was something that happened. There's a movie which came out, which is called Mumbai. Right? It happened in 2008 in Mumbai, where people just came with guns and just start shooting people like they're dogs. This diet, these young terrorists that we have, you know, they were brainwashed. It can happen even here in Zambia, if, if you're not mistaken. It can happen. You're just there, uh, moving on the bus, the bus, and your life ends. Is this the world that you want? It can happen. One day you wake up, you have got cancer. You just wake up, and then you find there's cancer. And then they tell you why well, it's terminal cancer, and it's in stage four. 
You only have two months to leave. What will you do? Is this the world that we want? Do you want to live here? No. The problem is that we don't spend much time in the Word of God. We don't see another world better than this one. We think this is home. This is not home. So don't, we are pilgrims. We are called pilgrims. We are just passing through this. So don't get comfortable here thinking, ah, no, me, I've reached. Do this, I can do this. Yeah, yeah, you can do all that, but be careful while you're doing those things. You might get caught up, and then you, you get caught up in the whole final destruction of everybody else. So Satan is also interested in this final event because he knows that it will bring his reign of sin and terror to a speedy end. He knows that. You know that this, when this warning is given, my, my, my reign of sin has come to an end. He doesn't want to die, by the way. He knows God has promised him, the time is coming, you're gone. They know the demons, Satan, they know exactly what's going to happen to them. So they're buying time. Yeah? But one of the ways in which the devil is buying time is blindfolding all of us, especially us who have the message, this message to give to the world. Blindfolding this brother, that brother, that pastor, that conference, and all this, we become blind and we just hear singing kumbaya, as if we're on the beach and drinking our drinks, and everything else is fine. And it says, by the time we know it, probation has closed, Jesus Christ has seized his work in the most holy place, and we are not saved. That's how final it will be. And we're expecting the whole church one day, it's all revived. Everybody else is on fire. The brother is on fire. That one is everybody else. No, she says, if you're waiting for that moment, you're waiting for an impossibility. It's not going to happen. You will have to take it personal. You don't have to wait for the whole church now. It's on fire. Everybody else, this brother is doing this. No. There will be a shaking in the church. Are you with me? God is going to see and sieve and all the rest it says actually even the fake pastor moved out and that's God's process it's not us to do I agree us is just to embrace everyone we don't know who's the tear we don't know who's the wheat so embrace every brother and sister in the Lord but God will come and do it and shake and when he shakes he only has the best around he says okay now here's the spirit by the way the whole church is asleep huh we are represented as the ten virgins, right? There were five that were foolish, and five were what? So two groups, right? Did they all sleep? Yes! yes. They all slumbered. But one group slumbered with oil, one group slumbered with no oil. One group slept but had oil. The oil of the Holy Spirit was waking upon them. Another group just slept. They had the Bible, they had the ornaments and all this. Ah, their Bible is just like this. Nothing. But for the others, they were seeing something. The Holy Spirit was opening their eyes. They were seeing something, even though they were asleep. So the whole church is asleep. And during the shaking, the others wake up. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Now the others say, we need oil. They cannot run by. I mean, there's no oil to buy. I mean, they come, they find the door is closed. Take those parables seriously. The whole church is asleep. There's no one awake, not even me talking to you. Everyone is asleep. But the question is, are you asleep with oil or no oil? <laughs> That's interesting. Do you have oil? Eh? Well, yeah, sleep is just, no, that's, that's just sleep. Huh? <laughs> that's the main question, right? Are we asleep with oil or no oil? <laughs> That's a very personal question. My brother, you're right. You're right. So, in Revelation 18, we still have time. Revelation 18, verse 1 to 5, is a repetition of Revelation 14. Revelation 18, what we just read, is a repeat of Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12. Are you with me? So, there's a repeat, but the repeat. There's an amplification of the repeat. It's different, but there's a repeat. Okay? Revelation 18 joins Revelation 14. If you check the wording and the context of it all, you'll find that there's Babylon being mentioned, right? And then in Revelation 14, there's Babylon. That's in Revelation 14, 
that's uh, the second angel's message, right? Babylon has fallen. But this time around, it is fallen in Revelation chapter 18, and there is more mentioned about it. Are you with me? There is more revelation about what Babylon is doing. It has become the cage of every fowl and unclean birds. That, those are like demons. Are you with me? Those are demons. <laughs> unclean beds and all this, that is what Babylon has become. And God is saying, listen, come out. Come out. Don't partake of our sins. Come out. In Revelation 4, 18. So there's this repeat which is meant. In, um, let's read a quotation from early writings, page 277. It says, the message of the fall of Babylon is given by the second angel and is repeated with additional mentioning of the corruptions which have entered the churches since 1844. So in 1844, the message was given. And then there was a coming out. God now had a church, his own, 1844. Are you with me? But now, that message is repeated with additional corruptions that have entered all these other churches. Okay, when it continues, it says, The work of this angel comes in at the right time to join the last work of the third angel's message as it swells into a loud cry. So this angel of, 18, of, of Revelation 18 joins the third angel's message and then amplifies the message. Are you with me? The way that the, the angel's messages are like this. Let me give you an illustration so that you don't miss this. It's not like one message. I try to put it like this. It's not like this is angel one, right? Angel one, then it jumps, it goes angel two, then angel three. No. It's like this. Angel one, after it's been proclaimed, it folds in into angel two, then it folds in into what? Angel three. That's how the three, in, the three angels' messages are. Are you with me? So they, they culminate, like they, they take in all together. I mean, this angel 18 comes in and adds its power to this threefold. And why calls it threefold. I would say threefold. It's a folded thing altogether. It's not like, oh, angel one, let's leave it there. Then let's go to angel two, let's leave it there. Then angel three. No, it's three folds. When they are, they are heaped together, then this angel comes and adds more power to it. Are we together? That's what we're seeing in the Bible. No new movement. It's the same old movement called, according to Great Controversy, page 611, it's called the Mighty Movement. So it's not like the Davidians say it. And Davidians are very funny creatures. By the way, they're not Christians, they're Davidians. Yes, they're Davidians, they're not Christians. That's why I tell them, most of them, you're not, you're not Christians, you're Davidians. You're not a Christian. So there's a difference between a Christian and a Davidian. Are you with me? The Davidians claim, whoa, oh, it's another movement. We will be the movement. We'll do this. They claim to be the angel of, of Revelation 18. They claim, we, huh, the angel of Revelation 18, do you have the glory to lighten the whole world? You, to give the three angels' message power. You have it, you. Like, really, you have power to give to these messages. You, you, a sinful being. No. You don't have that power. Huh? You have the power to lighten the whole world with your glory. What is your glory, first of all? What is it? Compared to what? Like, what is your glory? So they claim, like, okay, it's another movement. No, it's not that because it is threefold, it just comes and adds more power. Are you with me? It's, there's no movement. It's called a mighty movement because there's a mighty angel. There's a mighty angel that comes from heaven. If you look carefully who that angel is, you'll be shocked. And people claim to be that angel. <laughs> Who's got power to lighten the whole world with his glory? It is only Jesus. Are you with me? It is only him. He comes and then he lightens up the angels, the three angels' messages. And now people are able to see, oh, now we have to speak this way. Okay, the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every station, every missionary station in the world. 
And in some countries that were the greatest religious interest, where the greatest religious interest had been witnessed in the land since the reformation of the 16th century. But these are to be ex exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel's message. That is great controversy, page 611, paragraph 1. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost. The work will be similar to that of the day of what? What happened during the day of Pentecost? They received. They were what? In one accord. Do you know what made them to be one accord? What made them to be in one accord? The Holy Spirit? But what did he do to each individual when it came? To each individual, like here we're in one accord, right? We're talking, on, what did he do to Brother Peter, Sister Hajj? What did he do? The, gave them power to preach the gospel, but before power, something had to happen to them. You know, the disciples were not in one accord before, right? They were seeking who is the greatest. Yeah, me, I'm good. Yeah. Me, I sing better than you. I mean, this group can sing better. So they had the same tendencies that we have. We think, oh, me, I'm great. I should be the one doing this and this. So they had all these fightings in them. But during that time when they were waiting, do you know what happened? Read it from Acts of the Apostles. Quite interesting. Peter no longer saw himself as the great one. Man. The Holy Spirit broke him. It showed him the horror in his heart that he has got so much pride that Jesus Christ actually knew him from within, that he would actually deny. And that brought Peter. He started crying. And this other one started crying about his own unbelief. And, all this, and they were all crying. The Holy Spirit crushed them before it put them in one accord. Are you with me? It had to crush them. There was brokenness among them, crushing, 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 crushing. Now we are in one accord. Now you can operate as one. But the problem right now is that the church is not crushed. We're not crushed. We're full of ourselves. Ah, me. Ah, this one. Ah, this. My ministry. Ah, this. Oh, fighting for position. Ah, us, we should be on there and all this. We're not crushed. We need the Holy Spirit to crush us. And when it crushes us, it puts us in one accord. And when we're in one accord, then now we can go into the whole world, right? Are you with me? Now we can witness for the world. This is the mighty movement. The work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost as the former reign was given in the outpouring of the Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the springing up of the precious seeds. So the latter reign will be given to close the ripening of the harvest. So when the former rain came in, it's like the rains, right? When they start. They're there to spring up and all this. I mean, at the end, you have other rains that come in to harden the fruit, right? So that it's strong, the corn is strong, so that it's ready for the harvest, right? That's the same way, agriculture language there. Are you with me? That's the same way. Okay. That's from Desire of Ages as well. The final warning is called the loud cry of the fade angel. How much time do we have? Okay, let's go on. In Airy Writings, page 271, it says, I heard those clothed with the armor speak forth the truth with great power. So she's hearing there's a group of people that are clothed with what? Armor. Are you with me? Armor. It's like they are ready for battle. Huh? It's like they are ready for battle. And then it says, it had effect when they spoke the truth. It had effect. Many had been bound and some by wives some by husbands and some by children and some by parents. The honest that have been prevented from hearing the truth now eagerly lay hold upon it. All fear, all fear of their relative was gone and the truth alone was exalted to them. They had been hungering and thirsting for truth. It was dearer and more precious to them than life. Are you with me? So some of us here are bounded. We don't want to speak the truth because of what? Maybe this brother, maybe relative, I know this. And I, I can't speak the truth right now. But there will be a time when the only thing that will matter to you is speak the truth. And you will treasure the truth so much than your own life. When the spirit comes. Did Peter care about his life anymore? 
No. At first, it was a little girl that just came to him. You, you, are, you are part of them. I mean, he got scared, right? He was like, no, I wasn't part of him. But now, he spoke the truth boldly on the day of Pentecost where men could have killed him. But he told them, you killed Jesus. Right in their face. And those people had power to kill him. This is the same effect that the Holy Spirit is going to have on our hearts. Are you with me? To speak the truth without holding back. I asked, Ellen White is asking the angel, says, I asked what had made a great change about these people. And the angel answered, he said, he said, it is the latter end, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the loud cry of the faith angel. That is what is going to make a difference. Are you with me? We want the difference. First of all, we have to allow the spirit to crush us. And then the latter rain is going to come to cement us together. Out together, brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. I hope you're not dozing. <laughs> Let's go on. It says the fourth chapter of Reve- the fourteenth chapter of Revelation is a chapter of deepest interest. This chapter will soon be understood in all its bearing and the messages given to John the Liberator will be repeated with distinct utterances. So there will be a repeat, right? But this time around it will be distinct. You understand what you're talking about when you talk about the faith angel's message. The second angel's message. The faith angel's message. It will be distinct. There will be so much distinction and people will be able to see what we're talking about. I was shown, she said, I was shown three steps. The first, the second, and the third angel's message. Said my accompanying angel. This is the angel. He said, Woe unto him that shall remove one block or steer a pin from these messages. The true understanding of these messages is of vital importance. So what should we be doing? What do you think we should be doing now? We should be asking for the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see what is the importance of the three angels' messages that we've been given. What is it? Don't don't just listen to that bachelor in as much as you will receive light from all this. But, you know, we need to be weaned off people and start studying the Bible alone. Are you with me? I I used to like listening to preachers and not getting too excited until one person just told me, you know what, you're becoming a sermon junkie. You're just feeding on sermons and all this. That's someone junkie. Are you with me? And told me, listen, you need to start studying the Bible. I was like, I don't know. Teach me. And it began. And it's, it's, it's time consuming. It's, it takes everything away from you. Don't just listen to preachers. Oh, as much as they are good and all this, but you need to start studying. What does this mean? Really seeking wisdom from God. And God says, I will teach you myself. That's what he said, right? In the Bible it says, I will teach you myself. How about being tutored by God? Isn't that beautiful? Like he says, I'm going to teach you me. I will teach you. If you are really interested, I'm going to teach you. We need to understand what's the importance of these messages. Reading them right in center and all these, breaking this, getting this, getting all that. We have... We have online resources. There's this Bible on my phone. It's called My Sword Bible. You can read, you can go and check the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew behind it, and see what does this mean and all this. All because you don't want to show off to people that you know, but you want to know your God. That's the whole reason, man. Right? To show yourself, study to show yourself approved unto whom? Unto whom? The Bible says, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the words of truth. We're just remaining a surface reader. Just read this verse and then you're confused. Ah, so what does this mean? Ah, I know this and you're just caught up in there. No, you're going back and what does this mean? But really becoming interested in the Bible. Until it starts becoming a living thing. A living thing. I started studying my Bible when I was in school. And it was really hard. If you see how my Bible is, it's in tatters. Like it's really in tatters. 
It's got pages all over it. She's always laughing at me. Like, look at this Bible. You need to get a new Bible. You get me a new Bible, I'm going to write in it as well. My Bible has got more ink than print. I'm telling you this because I saw God starting working in my life through that word. More ink than print. If you see how it is, it's in tatters. Not because I'm righteous, because I'm a sinner, you understand me? And sinners need God. They really need God. If you think you're okay, don't do it out the Bible. People don't read the Bibles because they think they're fine. But a man who knows he's not okay, he will spend time with the infinite. Are you with me? Amen. Let's continue reading. It says, the true understanding of this message, these messages is of vital importance. It says, the destiny of souls hangs upon the manner in which these are received. The destiny of what? So, if your neighbor is lost, and you knew this truth. The destiny of that soul hangs upon these messages. There are souls that will be lost completely. It's not talking about, it's talking about eternal death here when it's, and it talks about souls. Are you with me? Souls will be lost completely. It's talking about eternal death. So the destiny of that soul hangs upon how these messages are received. Then how well do we need to study the Bible, brothers and sisters? So that we leave it out and we share it with others. So that they see that after this there is no more probation. Why is Revelation, Revelation 14 repeated? Why is Revelation 14 repeated? We still have time. It must be repeated because it must be in absolute present tense. Absolute what? present tense. Let us read them through so that you see what tenses they are in. Somebody to open Revelation 14, the 6 and 7. Who is going to read? Revelation 14, the 6 and 7. Revelation 14, the 6 and 7, brothers and sisters, let's read. We have like 15 minutes to go. Uh -huh. Revelation 14, the 6 and 7. <laughs> Mm -hmm. in the of heaven, that dwell on the what? Earth. On the earth. Okay. Okay. So it says, before you go, it says the everlasting gospel is preaching, is preached unto them that are, that dwell on the earth. Okay. Is that present tense? Does it say that a dwelling on the earth or that dwell on the earth? It's present. it's present, right? But it must be absolute present tense. Like now, are you with me? Like present continuous, right? Present continuous. Are you with me? Okay, so continue reading. Verse 7. He's saying with a loud voice. He's saying with a loud voice. What is he saying? Hear God and glory does it say for the hour his, of his judgment has come or is come? It's is come, right? Huh? Is come, are you with me? In other versions it says has. Because if you read it from the King James Version, which is the authorized version, because King James Version is accurate in the book of Revelation. Are you with me? Okay, it says is come. The hour of this judgment is come. Are you with me? Okay. Continue reading. <clears throat> I'll explain that. And mm -hmm. So this this verse is calling people to fear God and do what? And worship Him, right? To give Him glory because right now God is being robbed of His glory. Huh? God has been robbed of his what? Glory. So if I stand here and preach, and all the glory comes to me, I've robbed God of his glory. If you stand, my sister, who sings, right? If you stand and sing, and all the glory comes to you, if all the glory comes to you, you've robbed God of his what? Glory, right? Even by the Patrick, you sing, right? So if you stand, Brother Patrick, 
and you sing, and everybody, ah, Brother Patrick, his voice and all this. Ah, you know what? You've robbed God of his glory. We need to give back the glory to who? God. We're living in a world where people want to get the glory. Ah, it's, it's one heart getting the glory. It's fountain gates getting the glory. It's TV Joshua. It's this. It's, 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 it's a man-centered kind of thing. Are you with me? It's not Jesus-centered. Jesus is not being glorified. We should be like John the Baptist, who said that I should do what? I should decrease and you must do what? Increase. That should be our ministry. When you see, when Jesus got, do you know what happened? It's funny when you read it from, from uh, Ministry of Healing. That's one of my favorite books. If you read from Ministry of Healing, I think it's in chapter one, it says he's our example. Read that if you are interested in ministry. Read that. It says Jesus, when he would preach, do this, and then the next day the disciple says, ah, let's go. And then he said, no, let's go, let's go to another city. So like, we had so much success last time. And then he says, no, let's go to another city. And you know what Ellen White says? He says, mere worldly success would have interrupted with him and his M Y E K. Worldly success and fame would have gotten in his way. So Jesus would say, boom, and then would go to another one. And when he preaches, and then he, he detaches himself. He preaches, he detaches himself. He wasn't like in one place, ah, okay, now, now I've gotten this, and then everybody else, Jesus would detach himself, detach himself, detach himself. He's going on doing his business. I mean, that's ministry, proper ministry. Do we do that? Huh? Do we do that? That's interesting, right? Because me, when I look at this, uh, that's, that's, that's ministry that is rare. Are you with me? Rare ministry. And he's called you to that ministry. Don't get the glory of God. So, what do we see? The preaching of the everlasting gospel and informing them that the hour of this judgment is come. The full and correct revelation of the law, that's the everlasting gospel, the law and the gospel from the everlasting gospel has not yet been given to the world. The judgment has not yet progressed, which has been in progression. How long has the judgment been in heaven? Let's see if you are students of the Bible. How long has it been going on, the judgment? Since when? Yeah. So you need to ask yourself, since when did it begin? Up to date. This is 2019, right? How long has it been in procession? Since 1844, yes. So you know that. So it's how many years up to now? 175 years. So the judgment which has been in procession 145 years, has it passed from the case of the dead to the case of the living? No. Not yet. There are events that are mentioned in prophecy that are going to be signaling us saying, okay, now it has passed from the dead, those that have died, to the living. So it's been going on for a hundred and what? Jesus Christ has been locked up in the most holy place for 175 years. Do you think he wanted to be locked up for that long? Oh God, I hope God is going to help us to Get to the point where I want us to get. So angel number two, it says, angel number two, Revelation 14, verse eight. Let's read. It says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is what? Is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she had made all nation drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So this message must be repeated. For Babylon has not made, has not yet made all nation drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Have all nations drunk? No. But the question is, are all nations drinking? Huh? Yes. Are you with me? But has it co finally completed? No. So we need to repeat this message. Okay? And then it says, the last union of the nations and Babylon, as described in Revelation 4, 17, has not yet been fulfilled. Not yet. Okay, not all nations, not until the union of church and state has been fully manifested throughout the Christian dome, will the final fall of Babylon be complete. The change is progressive one, and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14, verse 18, is yet future. Great controversy, page 
3.19. So let me explain it to you. There is a perfect fulfillment that is coming right now in this world. Are you with me? Church and state, they are what? Blending as one. What you should, what should interest you about news is what is happening with the churches and Rome. Are you with me? Not so much the political scenes and all this. Don't get caught up with Putin and all that. That's not so much our interest. Our interest is when we see the churches, the Sunday churches, coming close with Rome, the Protestant movement, so to say, those that protested and say, hey, when you see Lutherans signing concessions, I you me? Because right now they're doing that. They're signing concessions. And when you see evangelist, evangelistical churches, when you see the Baptist church moving, when you see all these prominent churches moving in and signing concessions with, with Rome, then there's that unity which is coming. And that, that unity, guys, that's the formation of the mark of the beast. That's the image to the beast. The image to the beast is when Protestants give up all what made them to be Protestants. What, what made us to be Protestant in the first place? You know your history, right? Yes. Why are you a Protestant? Yes, my sister, why are we Protestants? Uh, because the, the uh, Luther's way, mm -hmm. they read the Bible, then they realized to say what was being taught was not according to the way, that's why they protest to say we follow what is in the way. What is in the way, right? So there was only the Bible and the Bible alone yes. is the rule of faith. Yes. Are you with me? There was Sola Gracia. Sola scriptura, sola what what? They said sola, right? They were saying only the Bible, only the Bible, only the Bible. So they protested. Are you with me? When they protested, the fight. God, I don't have much time. But we started late. Because I want these thoughts to sink in. Lord, help me. Okay, so here's the thing. When they protested, when they protested, it was based on what Luther, what Wesley, what Zwingli, what all these reformers that you're going to read about. They say, listen, salvation is by faith and faith alone. Not by works. We're not saved by works. We're saved. So that was like the Magna Carta. That was like the main message that they had to give. They say, we are saved by faith alone. Now what you're seeing in Christendom is that the Roman Catholic Church had a counter-reformation. To counter the reformation that was started by Luther and all these, they, they came up with the Jews, the Jesuits. Are you with me? You've heard about the Jesuits, right? Yes. Yeah, if you go to Unza, as you are driving Unza, passing through, the, there's actually a beautiful place there, and it's written, the Jesuits. They're here in Zambia. The Jesuit Society is here in Zambia. What is their aim? Their aim, they're like soldiers of the Roman pontiff office. Their aim is to counter everything that Luther was trying to teach. Counter everything. That's their aim. Are you with me? So they come and counter it by teaching a false salvation concept. Are you with me? So right now, the Lutheran church, ha, I think Luther is turning in his grave. The Lutheran Church and all that, they signed the concession on justification by faith. Google it. They signed just recently with Rome. And if you read what the agreement is about what justification by faith is, it's a masterpiece. They know how to maneuver with language, but they have mingled it with error. They have mingled the two. They have mingled sanctification, sanctification and justification. They have mingled it as a way of salvation. Are you with me? It's so mingled. I wish we had time. would have gone through it one by one so that you see what is happening. And when you look at it, the way it's been mingled, if you don't know the original, you will fall for the first one. Huh? If you, if you haven't read about what justification by faith is, that is why I was running you through in the morning, right? Trying to see, trying to get you back to that so that you see where you're coming from. The roots of you protesting, being a protestant church. So when we give up that, when you see that unity coming in, that tells you that time is near 
time is near, the end is here, the end is here. And most of the Protestant churches in America are supporting Trump. Are you with me? Protestant churches, the evangelistic, evangelical churches are the ones that voted for Trump. They're the ones that are praying for Trump. They're the leaders behind. If you read the circle that Trump is under, read, read about the advisors behind him. Just read. Spend time looking at news. Be a student of prophecy. See what's happening there. You actually know that we don't need to play games anymore in the church. We need to be hearing messages that are awakening you from your slumber. Say, wake up. Start preparing. Put the Lord Jesus Christ inside your heart. Let him be the rule of your life. Don't play games. Let's start thinking about Jesus. Let's start focusing. Let's start praying. Let's start agonizing. Is there anything that is... That is what is supposed to be happening to us right now. But the devil is putting us into a sleep. We're dozing. This is what is happening. And they're uniting. So the angel of Revelation 18 is a representation of the threefold message with distinct utterances. Now because I have five minutes, what am I going to do? What caused the wounding of the beast? We hear about the wounding of the beast, right? We say that there was a time when the beast was wounded. Yeah? It was wounded, right? But the wound will do what? Heal, right? So what caused the wounding of the beast? Which is the, the part, part system. What caused its wounding? What wounded it? If you know what wounded it, you will know what is causing it to heal. Are you with me? If you know what wounded it, it was the preaching of justification by faith. That led to other monarchs that saw what Luther was saying was truth. They started rebelling against the Catholic movement. They, 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 they protested. The, the Protestants were like kings and princes that attended the deity when Luther was speaking. Right? They were there from all, and then they heard that this guy is actually right. And then the nation started protesting. And then it laid into the ripple effect that caused the wounding. I mean, it was wounded. General Beatty and his armies went in and then took in the Pope, and then the Pope was in captivity. Then he died right there, right? So you see history because of what Luther started and all these others started. Because of justification by faith, it caused the wounding. So right now, the wound is healing. It's healing. It's healing because now they're saying, oh, we're now agreeing, right? We believe the same thing, okay? Let's not worry about doctrine. And we believe the same thing. We still believe justification is by faith and all this, but they've twisted it. They've twisted it so much. This is what you're seeing in the world right now. They've twisted it. The perversion of the truth of the gospel, the perversion of righteousness by faith alone, mingled with sanctification, is what is called the, the son of perdition. The son of what? Who was called the son of perdition in the Bible? Come on, think. Who was called the son of perdition in the Bible? Judas, are you here? What was the identifying mark of Judas? How did God identify him as the one who's going to betray him? And sell him off. It was during that last supper. What happened? Tell me, tell me. What happened during that last supper that Jesus said, This is the one who's going to betray me? Next. Ah, now you're getting it. Are you with me? He mingled the wine and the bread. Are you with me? And he partook of it. The mingling of the two. The wine is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's, sang, that's justification. Are you with me? That's his death on the cross for us. That's our justification. And then the bread is sanctification. It's the bread that sanctifies. It's the word of God that does what? Sanctifies us and cleanses us up. Are you with me? So the mingling of the two, when you see a church mingling the two, they have entered into perdition. They are the ones that are going to betray Jesus. That's a sign of perdition. Actually, the Catholic system is called the sign of perdition in the Bible. By Paul, he identifies it as the sign of perdition. The ones that are going to sell out Jesus. 
So it's the mingling of the two. Time has come that the messages must be proclaimed with a loud voice. But you see there has been a delay from 1844 up to now. Why is it that, what, what is happening? Why are we still here? Why are we still here? We should, yes, no. yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. We keep the message to ourselves, then secondly, we don't understand what the message is. There's a lot of confusion I mean, to what the message is. So we keep the message, we'll be like the Jews. The Jews were given the way of salvation, right? But they hoarded the message. They hoarded it, and then she says, because they hoarded it, it turned into corruption. It's like they had the living manna. When manna stays for too long, what happens? It decays, it becomes worms. Okay? So, no, mark, no marking of time. We don't need to wait for the judgment to pass to the living or for the wounds to be completely healed or for the mark of the beast to be reinforced. The program of coming events is in the hands of God. He allows the events to come on the scene of history as he sees his people prepare for them. Are you with me? So God will allow events to start coming as he sees you and me preparing for them. But we have delayed the coming of Jesus. Because we are not preparing. From 1844, the Bible says there should be time no longer, right? We don't operate under time premise. So from 1844, we've been living under borrowed time. Borrowed time that we're in. We, we should have been gone by now. But because we did not, she, actually she says, Jesus Christ would have come a long time ago if the Advent movement were true to what they were given. But when 1844 came in, people disbanded. Only a small band remained. And it was just young people and one old guy. Ellen White was 14, 17. James White was what? It was just like young people trying to pray. What happened? Why did we get disappointed? I mean, they started studying. God wanted that mighty movement. A lot of people had joined. But after that disappointment, what happened? Oh, let's go back to business as usual. It's not happening. So God has been trying. I'm trying to talk to you about what's happening up there so that you get hooked. So we're living on borrowed times. And here are the facts that we have. God has given us a complete message. There should be no delay in finishing the work of God. But we're the ones to be blamed for the delay of God. This is what made me stop today. I think we're going to finish. We're finishing, other people. We're finishing, okay. This is what made me stop and not continue. In Acts chapter 4, let's read these verses carefully. Because I think, so far, I think these are the most powerful verses that I've read this year in the Bible. Acts chapter 4, verse 26 and 7 to 28. I want someone to read them as clearly as possible. If you're not reading them clearly, I'll read them alone. Acts chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 26, 27 to 28. We're ending on this note. Let me read them to you. It says, The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against who? Against who? Against the Lord and against his Christ. Verse 27, For a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the children of Israel, gathered together. Are you seeing there? Are you seeing what's happening in, that verse, in those verses? We have the kings of the world, the, the, the children of Israel, are also gathering together with these heathens. They're gathering against whom? against Jesus. They're gathering together. Then this 28 it says, For to do whatever thy hand in thy counsel has determined to be done. 
when I read this, I don't know, but it struck me so hard that I, I started crying. I read it this morning. Like everyone has gathered against who? Including the children of Israel. We've gathered against him to do whatever. You see, God has given us Jesus. What is it that you're doing with Jesus? What is it that you're doing to Jesus who God has given you? We deny him, we spit on him, we, we don't want him. And the whole world has gathered against him, including the children of Israel. Everyone has gathered against him to do whatever they want. And God, you know what God has done? He told us in Isaiah 53, if you read Isaiah 53, the whole chapter, he told us, like, listen, I will give you my son. And when I give you my son, you're going to kill him. The Jews said, no, we can't kill God, come on. And what happened? It happened. Jesus was given. And what happened? We killed him. And you go like, no, we didn't do it. It was the Jews. No. Listen, Isaiah 53, there is no they there. You will find there is no they. They did this and not this. There is we. There is us there. There is we did this. We did this. For our sins he was wounded. For our transgression this was done. Humanity has been found wanting in killing God. To do whatever we want to Jesus. This shows you and me how evil we are from the inside. We couldn't stand the most righteous person. It only took him three years of ministry and we took him out. And what took him out? It was human beings. It wasn't animals. It wasn't any of these animals. It was us. Are you with me? That's why Isaiah says, he even identifies himself with the killers of God. He says, we did this. We rejected him. We spat on him. The death of God hangs, you know, Ellen White says, listen, don't forget too quickly that we're still living in a world that rejected God. We're still living in that world. The world that said, no, we want another king. We don't want Jesus. Don't forget too quickly. We don't want him. We don't want him. So that's why I would rather do things where, you know, let's try to conform. Let's not do this. We don't want to show that we are followers of Christ. This is what brought me in the morning. I was like, Calvary plays out itself in our lives on a daily basis, brothers and sisters. What are we doing with Jesus? What has caused the delay? We have elected another, another king to sit and rule in us. We don't understand the third angel's message and its implication, and because of that, we are powerless in preaching the gospel to others. We have become, our, our, we become false witnesses of God. We, I mean we, I'm not saying you, right? I'm all encompassing. We have become this. Every day, you're being given Jesus. What are you doing with Jesus? Every day, you're giving Jesus. What are you doing with him? Are you stripping him naked again on the cross? This is the weighty responsibility that we've been given. In, in Zechariah, we'll read these verses and then we'll end. In Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and the spirit of what? Supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they are pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his son. It's 12 verse 10. They shall mourn for him as one mourns for his son, and there shall be bitterness for him 
has one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. When we look upon Jesus, we think, oh, he was killed by the Jews and all this. But the Bible says, when you look upon him, when the spirit of grace, that's what happening. That's what happened with the disciples when the spirit of grace was poured upon him. There was also the spirit of supplication. They started mourning. They said, we have killed God. They moaned as one moaned for his son. In Proverbs chapter 1, chapter 1, verse 23, let's read these verses and we'll end. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23, listen brothers, listen to this. It says, turn. When the Bible says turn, what does it say? What does it mean to turn? To repent, right? It says, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour upon, I will pour upon my, I will pour my spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. Only if you turn, if you repent, I will pour my spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. Verse twenty. The horrors of our souls. It says, "Turn, repent." Somebody said to me this. He says, "Listen, repentance." Repentance, turn, doesn't seem like a gift, right? Not until you can't repent anymore. Not until you can't repent anymore, then you understand it's a gift from God. Repentance is a gift from who? From God. So while we still have the time, brothers and sisters, God says, repent. It's a gift that comes from God. The goodness of God. The goodness of God should lead us to what? Repentance. That's what the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 2. It says the goodness of God should lead us to repentance. But repentance doesn't seem like a gift. Not until you can't repent. You know there will be a time when you cannot repent. Listen to what Proverbs says. We're continuing. Verse 24 of the same chapter 1. It says... Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my arm to you, and no man regarded. The 25 it says, But ye have said to nigh all my counsel, and not that and have said to nigh all my counsel, and would none of my reproof, you would have none of my reproof, and I will laugh at your calamities. God says he's going to laugh at your calamities. Why? When you're stretching out his arm, he said, nah. When he was giving you counsel, no. We've been given counsels to the church. Are you with me? He has given us all the counsels that we need. But listen, no one reads counsels to the church to the church these days. Yeah? It's only at Ridge where, where I saw people doing that. They had a culture of reading counsels to the church, at least a, a segment to read to the church. It's counsels to the church. The church needs to be counseled by God. But we've said it at night, like, ah, you know what, we'll read this other stuff, but ah, not this stuff. We don't read it. That is why there's so much sin in the house of God. It continues, it says, I will laugh at your calamities. I will mock when your fear comes. At first, your fear wasn't there, but now it's there. You want to repent and God is going to mock at it. And then it says, when your fear comes as desolation, and your destruction comes as a wind. Your, your distress and your anguish comes upon you. Verse 28, and you shall call upon me and I will not answer. You will seek me early, but you will not find me. You will wake up to seek him early, but you will not, he was not going to be there. He's not going to be there. There will be nothing. It will be like you're praying and you're hitting the ceilings. Nothing. It's like brass in the ground. Brass in the sky. You're hitting the brass skies. No prayers are going up there. You're seeking him. You're crying and all this. And he's not answering. Why? At the time when he was calling upon you to do that, he said, no, later. Postponing it, right? I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it the other day. 
I'll do it the other day. I'll do it the other day. And the more you do that, the more you build the wall and you won't be able to listen to the Holy Spirit. Verse 30 said, verse 29, sorry. For they that hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Verse 31, Therefore, they shall eat the fruits of their own ways and be filled with their own devices. This, my friend, is hell. Are you with me? This is hell. This is torment. God cannot hear you anymore. You pray, you do this, you try this, you try by all means to do this, you mutilate yourself, you cut yourself, you do this. God can't hear you anymore. Do we want to get to that point? Do we want to get to that point? When heaven is just closed up. My brothers and sisters, heaven is open for business. Heaven is open for business today. Now, as I'm talking to you, now, heaven is open for business. You and me have been called to repent, return. Return to me. And I'm speaking like this because God spoke like this to me today. Like, really? He did. And I was just in tears. God has said, listen, my church needs to be broken. Because my church is full of itself. There's no brokenness in the church anymore. It's not there. It's your obligation to take this thing personal. Maybe today is the last day you're going to hear such a message. Ellen White actually says that. He says, who knows? Who knows? Maybe the faithful preachers that are preaching in the church will be the last one. I mean, she says, when, there's, she says, when the daughter of fashion is adorning herself, when the merchant man, the businessman, is busy with his business, who knows? Maybe that's the time when probation will close. We don't have time. He says there shall be time no longer. Right? There's no more time. So I'm asking you to return to Christ. Like spend time with him, brothers and sisters, like never before. I don't care. This is a small number. I usually speak to small groups. I don't know why. I don't care about the stage and whatever stage. For me, I said, Lord, wherever you're going to take me, if it's two people, that's okay. If it's one person, that's fine. Because where two or more are gathered, there his presence is there. And God is faithful. Are you with me? He is faithful. He will do, don't underestimate what God can do for you or through you. Are you with me? Don't underestimate. Don't you know me? I don't know this. Me, I knew nothing completely about God. But God had to teach. And he's been teaching every day. And and I think God is desperate. You know why I think God is desperate? Because he's getting the weak among you. Not the strong, but the weak. He's like reaching to those weakest among you. Are you weak, brothers and sisters? Do you feel you're weak? That's okay, because God can use that weakness. Because the weak are not going to rely on their strength. Are you with me? They rely on the outside strength who is God himself. So take this thing person. I've talked to you like this because for me I feel there's time no longer. We don't need to play games anymore in a puppet. No, no more games. No, no more games. We need to give the people the truth that we've been given. I don't want to be that kind of a person who was given an opportunity to preach and I never told you the truth. If you practice medicine, and someone has got cancer and you just bandage them up. And then later on, the cancer starts eating them. They will take away your license. Are you with me? They will say you are a bad practitioner. You should have gone deep to the cancer. Open the bone. Take away the cancer so that the person does not die. But a lot of pastors are doing that in our time. They just bandage you up. Oh, you're fine. Ah, don't worry. You know, bandage you up, bandage you up. And they are not talking to you about the cancer of sin that is eating you from within. They're not. And you know what God is going to do? He's going to raise humble people like you. 
is going to get people that are not so well known. That's what the Bible says. That's what Ellen White says. It says, great men, the people that you admire, it says they're not going to be part of finishing the work. The ones that are going to finish the work are those obscure people. It's going to get them. Like he called Elijah from the plow, right? It was Elisha. Elisha was, was like a servant boy, busy there. And God went and says, take the mantle. Take the mantle, let's go. He wasn't going for the big, big guys. He says, I'll go with the little, little guys around you. That's God's work. So I'm saying, guys, brothers and sisters, do not underestimate what God can do for you. There's, there's no time. And time is a talent, right? I was talking to my fiancée. I'll be marrying her in September. I was talking to her about time. You know what Ellen says about time? God is going to require the strictest account on time. Because time is a talent. You can develop it. You can develop it. The strictest account on how we spend our time. God is going to require the strictest account. Not on any other talent. Brother Patrick, your singing talent and those. But how you spend your time. Because time, time is not money. Money you can lose and gain. Time is life. How you spend your life. And your life is borrowed, by the way. It's not yours. Are you with me? It's not yours. This life you have is not yours. It is Jesus' life. It's an extension of his. How are you spending it? Brothers and sisters, there's so much, but I'll end here. I'll end here because we have to end. Let us pray. Father in heaven, there's so much that you want to say to our hearts today. And we know, Lord, that you've visited us today through your word. You've spoken to us calmly, humbly, severely, even, Lord. But you've not made us sorry for the sake of made us sorry. But you've made us feel the deep-seated sins in our lives for a reason. It's so that we can run to a Savior who is Jesus Christ himself. Father in heaven, I, I don't know who, I don't know most of these people that are seated in this room. I don't know what their struggles are. I don't know where they have been, but you do. And you're then that this time around, on this day, they should be here and hear your message. Therefore, Lord, do that which you've designed that you should do upon their hearts. I pray, Lord, that may the Holy Spirit imprint the things of God on our hearts. May you give us the spirit of grace and supplications. May we see Jesus for he is in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to preach the word. It's the least I can do, Lord, to just present you to the people. I am no man but a worm, Lord, I'm dust. Therefore, I pray that may my glory go into the ground and may all glory be given unto Jesus Christ. May glory, honor, and praise, and power, and dominion be given unto him. May he be crowned king of kings and lords of lords. May he be given everything because he is our everything. He is our reality. He is our life. He's our king. He's our brother. He's our God. He's our Lord. May we live for him, Lord. It's in the mighty name of him that we pray. Amen.